Hello and welcome to this special edition of the Aperture Podcast. I'm Mike Mimoso and joining me today is Noam Moshe of Clarity Team 82 and we're going to talk about the Evil PLC attack. Evil PLC is a technique developed by Clarity's research team that uses programmable logic controllers as a vehicle to gain code execution on an engineering workstation application. And ultimately that access uh, affords them access to any PLC elsewhere on the OT network that that workstation plugs into. So we're going to talk to uh, Noam about this. Team 82 unveiled this research at DEF CON, uh, as well as on our website, an extensive research paper and blog and, and podcast. And uh, we're going to discuss with Noam today, who was one of the several team members involved in the research, uh, about some of the details of this attack and, and why it matters so much. So how you doing, Noam? Thanks for, for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so I, I know that this was, what, two years of work on this project. Do you remember kind of like the early motivations for it? Yeah, so just like you've said, uh, it's a long way coming to this point. I mean, uh, we've started collecting uh, primitives and vulnerabilities uh, two years ago, actually. Uh, and it all started when we wanted to take a look uh, at new approaches, new attack vectors, when uh, talking about industrial networks. Uh, we wanted to explore new things, uh, and that's when we've noticed uh, this new technique could be a new, actually, vector completely. Uh, and we've started exploring it and uh, checking when, when we found the first vulnerability, we, we wanted to check wider and see maybe it's not just this specific thing here and this specific vulnerability, maybe there's a wider issue. Uh, and that's what we aim to do. And I think we demonstrated it. Uh, so it, it was a very uh, long way coming. It was very, very uh, fun. Uh, and the idea was showcasing uh, this new technique, this new vector altogether. So this isn't your typical attack that involves a PLC. I mean, usually when a PLC is involved and it's targeted, you're an attacker is going after the process that the PLC uh, controls. Um, but this is a bit different. So kind of explain uh, to the to the viewers what Evil PLC is, is about and, and how it's different from, I want to call it a traditional PLC attack. Y yeah, so just like you said, uh, if... I, and I think most people would think about regular attacks on uh, PLCs uh, and just like we've seen in the past, uh, we think about uh, damaging the process itself, be it uh, critical processes like water, electricity, uh, to uh, manufacturing, etc. Uh, this is what we think is the main reason for attackers to attack. Uh, however, when we look at how these attacks usually happen, uh, the uh, starting point is usually accessible PLC. Uh, although sometimes attackers try and uh, leverage and uh, get access to protected PLCs, most of the times when we talk when we talk about attacks on PLCs, we talk about internet-facing PLCs, uh, and we wanted to explore this uh, and uh, see how can we. Uh, get a hold of these internet-facing PLCs in order to widen our grasp, grasp. So like you've said, we take this idea that the PLC is what, what's being attacked and we flip it on its head. Uh, and from the attack key, uh, the PLC becomes the attacker. Uh, so we abuse a mistrust that the engineering wall station places in PLCs. Uh, and we want to exploit and uh, exploit vulnerabilities in the workstation. Uh, and using this technique, that this approach to vulnerability uh, research, uh, we found many different vulnerabilities that could le lead uh, an engineering workstation connecting to a weaponized PLC being attacked uh, and the attacker gaining remote code execution on the engineering workstation itself. Uh, and then he has approach to many different uh, vectors. He could use this engineering workstation as a pivot point to other uh, locations in the OT network. Uh, he can use it to infiltrate the IT network, which could be uh, 
uh, a little bit more trickier to get into uh, the attacker could use it to uh, jump from one side to another from different uh, companies etc uh, so there's a very wide range of uh, uh, vectors that could be used once you leverage this technique yeah that was kind of my next question is why would the engineering workstation be such an important target? It really is that bridge between OT and IT and other PLCs, or if you want to drop, drop ransomware, it's, it's a pretty tempting target, right? Yeah, and when we think about uh, internet-facing PLCs, while there are many, there are even more not internet-facing PLCs. Uh, so this could be used as the initial access foothold, the initial foothold to bridge one internet-facing PLC that could be misconfigured, that could be uh, exposed on the internet, and we, uh, or an attacker could attack it and weaponize it. Uh, and instead of uh, just damaging the process that this PLC in specific uh, is responsible for, attackers can use this as the leverage point, as a pivot point to the whole OT network and even the IT network, which could be uh, interesting as well. Uh, so, so we think about this attack as a very, very interesting uh, pivot opportunity uh, because attackers could use the engineering workstation uh, and the centralized position it holds in both the IT and the OT network. Because we need to remember that engineering workstation are accessible to the whole or at least most of the OT network and it is still part of the domain, part of the IT network, it is still connected and sometimes it even holds a position of power there. Uh, so it, it's kind of a natural bridge and we wanted to explore the uh, bridging effect of it. Uh, we should probably say that most of these applications run on Windows machines, right? So they're subject to a whole host of other vulnerabilities and attacks sometimes, right? Yes, uh, most of the engineering workstation software runs on Windows machine. Uh, however, because modern IT solutions offer solutions for this, be it uh, firewalls, uh, patches, etc., uh, this could be a very, very interesting uh, uh, vector to attack the engineering workstation. Because if uh, the organization is well sanitized and it has proper uh, and network access control and proper uh, segmentations, it could be very hard to reach the engineering workstation. However, because we have access to this initial, only one uh, initial access to an OT asset that could be less important, we could use this uh, protocol where the engineering workstation uh, talks and communicates to the PLC and not and initiates the conversation to attack it. Uh, so it could be used in even the most uh, hardened IT networks. Uh, where solutions exist, we it could be used to bypass those solutions. So I want to go back to um, a point you made earlier about the trust that the engineering workstation has in the PLC. Can you, I, I think it's a really important point. And I, I was hoping you could explain that a little further and, and why it means so much in this in this context of this research. Okay, so th that's a great question because uh, as a vulnerability researcher myself, I usually uh, explore the idea of trust. And uh, when I see two talking uh, components, two communicating components, I try to think what are the uh, preconditions and what are the pre-thoughts that each component uh, has. For And one of those preconditions is trust. If one component completely trusts another one, uh, it could lead to many different interesting vulnerabilities. So in this specific case, uh, we have the PLC, the asset itself, uh, which considered uh, the main process. Uh, and we have the engineering workstation, which just configures it, uh, programs it, etc. And we noticed that in many different protocols that we have explored, and almost any, almost all OT vendor implements its own or its own uh, OT protocol, in almost all of them, the engineering workstation trusts the assets and trusts the PLC completely. It means that he, they think that uh, the uh, files and configurations and projects that are stored on the PLCs are safe, are validated, uh, and because they are there, we can trust them. 
And because of this, we see many different uh, skips of validations, uh, many different skips of uh, uh, making sure that everything is okay, that it makes sense. Uh, and we abuse this trust to implement uh, our own protocol and actually weaponize the PLC itself, which means that we upload a malicious project on it. And then whenever the engineer will connect and try to perform an Apple procedure, uh, they will uh, fetch our malicious project and will be infect infected. And because of this trust, the engineering workstation doesn't validate, doesn't check. Uh, and we found a, a few very interesting vulnerabilities that the source is this trust. So is that trust, is that a, a design decision kind of left over from the days of when people just weren't connecting PLCs to the internet, for example, or is there something else going on? I think the main problem here is uh, that we modernized uh, this architecture and started connecting PLCs to the internet, uh, maybe not to the uh, worldwide internet, but still LAN and uh, internet facing. Uh, and it, the attacker doesn't need uh, physical access to uh, use the PLC. Uh, and, and yeah, I think it's a remnant of days of old where uh, the PLC was very well protected. So you found, uh, the team found vulnerabilities uh, in products from seven vendors and many of the leading automation vendors uh, were involved in, in this research. Um, you mentioned there were some interesting vulnerabilities. Can you kind of just go into a couple that you found interesting and, and tell us why? I know most of the vendors either patched or mitigated the vulnerabilities. So I, I assume it's fairly safe to talk about some of these. Yeah, uh, so uh, I think the most important part is that we've seen these vulnerabilities in so many different platforms written in different languages from uh, C, C++, C Sharp, Java, all the way to many different uh, uh, types of vulnerabilities, be it memory corruption, disorganization, etc. Uh, so I think we covered a wide range of vulnerabilities in this research. Uh, and just to showcase a few, I think we found three different types of vulnerabilities. Uh, the first one is memory corruption, uh, which I think is very popular and most people know of. Uh, we found uh, a parsing issue uh, where the server didn't correctly check the bounds of an object it tried to access, uh, and it gave us a primitive of out of bound memory access. Uh, which we then leverage to achieve remote code execution. I think this is one of the uh, most interesting vulnerabilities. Uh, other than that, we found another uh, vulnerability type of disorganization, uh, which is very in interesting as well because it got very popular in the last few years. Uh, and of course, uh, the idea of supplying path characters uh, and achieving a right primitive outside of the intended folder was also a, a very common mistake we've saw. Uh, so I think the most amazing thing is that we've seen many different vulnerabilities of many different types in many different vendors and many different platforms. Uh, so we see that the issue is uh, more uh, general and not this specific implementation. You know, it, it's remarkable. I mean, I've been writing about security for a long time and some of these errors go back 20 years, maybe longer in terms of missing checks and simple things that developers could do to just kind of hold off a lot of these problems. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, the vulnerability in vulnerability research in general, uh, while we are always advancing and uh, finding new vulnerability types and uh, new mitigations and then bypasses to those mitigations, uh, the, the core concepts are uh, very primitive in the ID. It's a lack of check here that gives you this specific primitive. And then you combine it and uh, get a hold of another primitive. And at the end of the day, when I try to achieve an exploitation chain, I just collect the primitives one by one. And then my goal is to see how the wider picture, picture, picture uh, combines and how can I use these primitives uh, in conjunction with one another to uh, leverage and uh, enlarge my ability to control the system all the way to taking full control over it. Uh, so yeah, while it is a cat and mouse kind of game that we found vulnerabilities and it, they, they get patched and new mitigations are implemented, 
uh, I think uh, it's a very, very uh, good process and that the community in a, as a whole uh, went uh, and improved themselves. So if I'm an attacker and I want to pull off this, this type of, use this technique in an attack, what's involved in terms of understanding PLCs? What kind of knowledge do I need about PLCs? Do I need the documentation? Do I need hands-on experience? Um, you know, how, I guess I'm asking how much homework does an attacker need to, to pull this off? Uh, okay, so it really depends on the platform, but uh, in general, the first thing you need to do is to understand the process, the communication method, what is happening behind the scenes, because when an engineering workstation uh, connects to PLC, there's uh, a uh, very, very uh, complicated, sometimes easier, sometimes it's harder, but uh, a proprietary protocol, network protocol that the vendor implemented. Uh, and in most cases, they are not documented, at least not documented by the vendor. Uh, sometimes uh, security research researched this in the past and released some notes or presentation, but it's not documented as most internet protocols. Uh, so you need to start understanding what is happening behind the scenes? What is the engineering station providing to the PLC? How they uh, sync with one another? How they uh, uh, talk? Then you need to understand how the project, how the code itself uh, looks like. Because when we, uh, this whole attack vector uh, expo uh, exploits in the procedure upload process, this is when the engineering workstation pulls the current project from their PLC. Uh, so in order to, under to exploit this process, you need to fully understand what is being transferred, what the engineering workstation expects, what the PLC stores, etc. So the level of entry is not low, uh, it's not very low, uh, because some research has been published in this case. Uh, and in many different protocols in the past, so it could be a little bit easier. Uh, but the first step is understanding, and we're talking about deep understanding of what hap what is happening, uh, what kind of assets are being uh, passed in the network, etc. Uh, after you understand this, you need to start researching the code that the engineering workstation and the PLC use, and what the engineering workstation expects, what it parses, etc. Uh, and then the last thing is you need to have the ability to upload the weaponized project and weaponize the project in yourself. So that's another primitive that you need to get a hold of, be it writing a client, uh, changing, altering the project structure, storing it on the PLC. We're talking uh, another barrier of entry to this attack. So while it is not uh, the easiest one, it could be implemented at the end because prior research has been done. So a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, obviously, finding vulnerabilities is super important, but fixing them is probably ultimately more important. Uh, as we mentioned earlier in this particular research, most of the vendors either patched or, or mitigated these issues that you uh, privately disclosed. Uh, I, I'm wondering, what do you recommend users do? Obviously, applying the update would be the first step, but in terms of best practices, is it feasible to keep PLCs offline, for example? Are you seeing a lot of cases where they're missing strong authentication? Just some best practices for users. Uh, so I think the number one priority should be uh, network hygiene and segmentation. Uh, this whole attack vector, and actually most attack vectors, need to uh, start with network access. Uh, if we're talking about this evil PLC attack or even just damaging the PLC and the process it handles, we first need to gain access to the PLC. Uh, and while IT networks went uh, and exploded in uh, network hygiene, and network uh, uh, segmentation uh, best practices, I think all the networks did not uh, and are just starting to catch up and starting to understand how to probably segment and uh, limit access to the PLCs. And I think this should be the first step uh, because if attackers cannot access the PLC, they cannot attack it, at least not as easily as they could if it was just network accessible. Uh, so the first step is just network hygiene, segmentation, and uh, limiting access. The second step should be authentication and stronger 
authentication. Some PLCs don't support uh, authentication, some old PLCs, uh, but we recommend whenever it, it's an opt-in that you can enable uh, authentication and even better PKI-based authentication, it should be used because if we're talking about hard-coded uh, session key, uh, the barrier of entry is very low. It's simply network access. But if we're talking about PKI system that I need to gain all of credentials or, uh, pri or uh, certificates, the barrier of entry is way higher. So first of all, limit network access. The second tip is uh, better access control uh, in the authentication method. Great. So uh, last question, um, you know, I've been with Clarity two years now, and this is definitely one of the most interesting projects I've seen come out of Team 82. I'm wondering, is this your favorite research? Is it up there or are you just glad it's over with, given it was two years long, took two years to, to complete? Uh, I, I think that it was a very fun research because we took a wide approach and looked at many different vendors, many different softwares, et cetera. Uh, luckily for me, uh, most projects are projects that I love doing. Uh, I get to only do fun projects, so I can't say it's my most favorite project, uh, because, uh, but it's definitely up there. Uh, but if you see our blog, you see that we, we most of the time try to have fun and uh, look for vulnerabilities uh, in cool places and cool systems. So. Uh, it's a it was a very fun project. Project. I'm very happy that we got to share it finally, uh, because uh, it took some time, like you said. Uh, but definitely a fun project, and I enjoyed doing it. Great. All right, Noam. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm excited to uh, to see what's coming next from Team 82. So thanks again for coming on. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much, guys. It was a pleasure.